Today is the final day of this series. And our topic today is the topic of who is in control of the future. Who is in control of the future? That's the topic for today. Uh, now, I know some of you have been watching about the war that has been taking place in Syria. And this war that has taken place in Syria is a war that started in 2011. And this war that started in Syria, it all started because a few people were sick and tired of the regime that was ruling the country. And they demanded better lives. They demanded that employment be created in the country. They demanded that they want a new regime and stuff like that. And so because of all of that, a war broke out in Syria that has today lasted for eight years. And as we speak today, more than 400,000 people have been killed in this war. And we are still counting. Over 10 million people have been displaced from their homes. 10 million people have lost their livelihoods. 10 million people have lost all hope because of this war. Chemical weapons have even been used in this war, often killing people in some of the most inhuman way possible that is known to men. Mothers have lost their children. Children have lost even their mothers. Just this morning I read uh, about a mother with her daughters uh, and they have been hiding underground almost like the building has been destroyed and they have been hiding under the basement. They live under the basement. And all they hear is the sound of bombs, is the sound of airstrikes. And the mother was giving a testimony to say that her daughter is so overwhelmed with fear that she has even began to lose her hair. She's just literally losing her hair because of the fear that she's constantly under. And personally, I have often watched this war on the news. And I have often watched with a heavy, heavy heart. I've often asked myself, when, it is, when is it all going to stop? When is it all going to stop? We have prayed so much for the nation of Syria. I know many saints across the world, they have fasted and they have prayed for this nation. When is it all going to stop? Isn't it enough pain already that this war has caused? I've even had moments of doubt where I wondered if God really can stop this war. I remember uh, a very dear friend of mine, a dear brother, uh, we used to get into some very interesting uh, and often very emotional discussions with this friend of mine. This friend of mine, he is a great guy. Uh, he loves God and he loves people. But he really, really used to struggle he really, really used to struggle that God knows the future and that God ultimately controls the future. He just couldn't swallow this pill. He would often say to me, Offense, so you mean to tell me that God knew that that guy was going to binge on alcohol and then when drunk, get in a car and run down, killing a little child? Did he know this? And could he stop this? Why did he not stop it? And he would often say, that is impossible. It's not possible. There is no way that God can control every single thing. There is no way that he can be in control. Now, this view is often referred to as open theism. And this is basically the belief that God knows and he controls some things, a lot of things maybe, but not all things. This view is often called open theism. But there is yet another view that is called classical theism. And this view is that the belief is that God is absolutely knowing all things, that God knows how every single thing in all the future, in all history, God knows how every single thing plays out. And he is in absolute control of everything. But the big question then is, what is what? Which of these views is biblical? What does the Bible teach? And uh, to answer our questions today, we will be reading from the book of Isaiah. 
now Isaiah was an Old Testament prophet who prophesied to the nation of Israel. A prophet is one who is sent by God. A prophet is one who speaks on behalf of God in such a way that his words are God's very own words. And today we'll be reading from Isaiah 46. Uh, and in Isaiah 46, Isaiah prophesies to the Israelites after they had been taken into exile in Babylon. Israel was basically defeated and captured by a foreign nation and the nation of Babylon. And Babylon was a pagan nation. And when Babylon defeated Israel, they took many of the Israelites captive. And so the Israelites were captives for many, many years, living in the land of the Babylonians. And God, through, this word, through his word, speaks the words that we are going to read here today, this morning. Uh, and it's in Isaiah 46. Uh, and in Isaiah 46, God literally starts off by addressing the whole issue of idols. Because in Babylon, they worshipped idols. And Israel, being in exile in Babylon, might have been tempted to also worship idols. And so, let's start off by reading from the first seven verses. Isaiah chapter 46, verse 1 to verse 7. And as we read, I want you to observe this little word about bearing, who is bearing who, who is caring who, as we read, right? Isaiah 46, verse 1. It says, Bel bows down and Nebo stoops. Bel and Nebo were the most famous Babylonian idols. Bel bows down and Nebo stoops. Their idols are on beasts and livestock. These things you carry are born or carried as burdens on weary beasts. They stoop, they bow down together, they cannot save the burden, but themselves go into captivity. Listen to me, O house of Jacob, all the remnant of the house of Israel who have been born by me from before your birth, carried from the womb, even to your old age. I am he, and to great gray hairs I will carry you. I have made and I will bear. I will carry and I will save. To whom will you liken me? And make me equal and compare me that we may be alike. Those who lavish gold from the purse and weigh out silver in the scales hire a goldsmith and he makes it into a god. Then they fall down and worship. They lift it to their shoulder, they carry it and they set it in its place and it stands there. It cannot move from its place. If one cries to it, it does not answer or save him from his trouble. Let's stop there for a moment. So in the verses that we have just read, we see here that God reminds the Israelites that he cannot be compared to an idol. God says this idol things that they worship are useless. Basically, someone finds a few gold pieces and a few silver pieces and then they hire a fundi to make them an idol, to make them one and then they bow down to it and often when the Babylonians go to war because they believe that their idols will protect they would often take their idols with them and they would carry them using carts that of course were carried or pulled by animals burdening the poor animals for nothing and of course, if they were defeated, the enemy would basically capture their God. The enemy would basically run off with their gods. Why? Because these things cannot save themselves. When you cry out to them, they cannot hear. Therefore, they cannot answer you. After a time of worshipping, you would carry it on your shoulder and you would take it back to its stand. 
How useless were these things. But not the living God. No. Unlike the idols, he does not need us to carry him around. No. God is the one who carries us. Let's read verse 3 and 4 again. He says, listen to me, O house of Jacob, all the remnant of the house of Israel who have been born or carried by me from before your birth, carried from the womb, even to your old age, I am he. And to gray hairs, I will carry you. I have made you. I will bear you. I will carry you. And I will save you. And God speaks these words to us here today. If you have trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then by virtue of that, you are of the house of Jacob. And God is saying the same thing here today. From the womb, right until to gray hair, God himself is the one who is carrying you. But what does that mean? What does it mean to be carried by God? You know, I love to carry my little daughter, Abby. Sometimes I put her on my shoulders and I will take her for a walk. And I put her on my shoulders, shoulders just so that she can see things, so that she can see people, so that she can see trees, so that she can see the sunset and even see picky pickies. Sometimes I walk with her and when we get to some rough spot, where I know that it's not comfortable to walk, I would quickly carry her and walk her over the rough spot just so that she will not trip on herself. Sometimes I carry her to put her to sleep. Sometimes I carry her to protect her from the sun simply because I walk quicker. Actually, yesterday it was very hot. And when I arrived home, I arrived home yesterday. Uh, she wanted to hang out with me. And so I needed to do something quickly. I needed to get out of my house and walk across to do something quickly. And she followed me. And she was bare feet. And as she was walking at some place, it was so hot for her. And she started to scream. She didn't know whether to run back or to run towards me. But I quickly had to run to her and carry her. Right? Two weeks ago, I carried her to hospital, to the clinic, for her immunizations. Because I care for her. She absolutely hated every moment in that hospital. She cried the whole time. But I did it anyway because I care for her. A while back, while I was sitting in the living room with my wife, we just heard boom. It sounded like the sound of somebody falling. You see, she had tried to jump out of her cot. I quickly ran into that room and I grabbed her on the floor. I carried her. And with my hands almost shaking, trying to blow, not knowing what to do, I carried her to comfort her. Why do I carry her? Because I care deeply for her. Because I want to help her. Because I want to protect her. And in the same way, God is carrying you and me as his people. And as he carries us, he does it with so much affection. He does it with so much love and compassion and care and concern for you. I love how Romans chapter 8 says there is absolutely nothing, absolutely nothing in all of creation that can separate you from his love. There is no height, there is no depth, not even angels, not even demons, not even death itself can separate you from the love that God has for you. He loves you, dear friend. And to prove that he loves you, he has given his very best, his own life to die on a cross so that you might have life. If you ever for a second ever doubted the love of God, I would challenge you to look at the cross, meditate on it, see his suffering, the suffering that he endured so patiently just so that you might have life. And if after that you are not convinced then I'm not sure what else can be used to help you. Amen? And more, as God is carrying you, we have said he's supporting you, 
He's protecting you. He's literally upholding you by his very own strength. Amen. This past week, you spent hours upon hours in the dark traffic. Guess what? God himself was carrying you. You know, I often like to joke and say, man, nothing will happen to me until God says it's time and he calls me home. But that is not a joke. That is the truth. That is the truth. Amen? You know, when I carry Abby, my little daughter, often I'm taking her somewhere. Right? Whether I'm taking her to sleep, whether I'm taking her to see the doctor, or whatever thing else. Likewise, the thing is, when God carries us, he is taking us somewhere. Since God is the one who bears us, since God is the one who is carrying us, right from the womb to the old age, he says. The big question is then, does God know and does he control the future in which he is taking us? Does God know and does he control the future to which he is carrying us to? Or is he taking us to a future that he himself doesn't know? Taking us to a future that he himself does not control. And to answer those questions, I would challenge us. Let's read further uh, and in verses 8 to 11. Verses 8 to 11. Look at what he says. He says, remember this and stand firm. Recall it to your mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things of old. For I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things not yet done. Saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. Calling a bed of prey from the east. The man of my counsel from a far country. I have spoken and I will bring it to pass. I have purposed and I will do it. God continues the theme that he started in the first, verse, the first seven verses, explaining that he is like no other being in existence. And he says it twice. He says, I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. And then in verse 10, God shares two things, just two small things that make him different. And he mentions two things. The first thing he mentions in verse 10, he says, the first thing he mentions in verse 10 is that he knows the future. Uh, let's look at the beginning of verse 10 again. He says, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things not yet done. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things not yet done. So God says he knows the future. God declares the end right from the beginning. From the beginning, God is declaring the future even before it happens. And he says from ancient times, he declares things that are not yet done, which is the future. How is it that God can declare the future? Is it not because he knows it? In Psalm 139, verse 16, David says of God, Even before you were born, God had written all your days in a book. Even before you and I were born, God had written all the number of your days in a book. How crazy is that? So God knows what you will do this afternoon. He knows what will happen this week in Syria. God knows who will be the next president. He knows even the exact day that you will die, ultimately. He knows it all. 
Second thing that he says, and this is the second half of verse 10. Let's read the whole of verse 10 to get the flow. He says, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purposes. And I will accomplish all my purposes. So not only does God know the future according to verse 10, but God's counsel brings about the future. Amen? His purposes accomplish the future according to verse 10. God knows the future, but we all know that it's one thing to know the future because even some false prophets often have tried. And with some degree of accuracy, they have come up with something which is somewhat accurate. But God more than just knows the future, right? God controls every detail of the future. God controls every detail of the future. And in verse 11, God shows us how he did this in the life of Cyrus, the bed of prey from the east. That refers to Cyrus. Can we just read verse 11? He says, calling a bed of prey from the east, the men of my counsel from a far country. I have spoken and I will bring it to pass. I have purposed and I will do it. So basically Isaiah being a prophet, God told him all that would happen even before it happened. And so when Isaiah wrote these words, it was before Israel was taken into captivity. Israel, because of her disobedience, like God had told Isaiah, Israel got defeated and they got taken captive by the nation of Babylon. And Israel, for many, many years, lived in the nation of Babylon as exiles. But guess what? God, being God, then aroused the heart of Cyrus. Cyrus was the emperor of a nation called Persia. Cyrus was a pagan emperor. During the time of the exile, when Israel was caught up in Babylon, God aroused the heart of Cyrus, the emperor of Persia, to go to war with Babylon. And Cyrus went to war with Babylon, and he defeated Babylon. And he became the emperor over even Babylon, where the Israelites were living as exiles. But God didn't just stop there. Then God again, being God, he touched the heart of Cyrus to release the Israelites from captivity. And if you read it in the book of Ezra chapter 1, please, please go and read it for yourself. The book of chapter Ezra 1. You see Cyrus, a pagan king, acknowledging God and making a royal decree that the Israelites should be released to go back home, to go and rebuild the temple, to go and rebuild the city of Jerusalem. But not only that, Cyrus even takes out some of his own resources and that of his people to be used in the rebuilding of the temple. God himself did this. And if you, if you want a little bit of proof, can you just, can we quickly read Isaiah 45? Go back just one chapter. Isaiah 45, the first six, the first six verses. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped to subdue nations before him and to loose the belts of kings, to open doors before him that gates may not be closed. I will go before you and level the exalted places. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hearts in secret places that you may know that it is I, 
the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name for the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen. I call you by name. He says, I name you, though you do not know me. I am the Lord and there is no other beside me. There is no God beside me. I equip you, though you do not know me, that people may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none like me. That's amazing, guys. So God chose Cyrus before even Cyrus knew it. God chose a pagan king, Cyrus, and God was with him as he became emperor. And God is the one who aroused the heart of Cyrus to go to war with Babylon. And God is the one who defeated the nation of Babylon through Cyrus. So then the question is, does God know and control the future to which he is carrying us? And the answer to that is, yes, he does. Yes, he does. But what about men's choices? Do they even matter? To be honest with you, there is some mystery here. And I don't have the perfect answer to it all. But the Bible is very clear that God cannot be fooled. Whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. Galatians chapter 6. You see, man is created with free will. We all make our choices. We choose between what is good and what is evil. And every single choice that we make has its own consequence. And that is fully the truth. But the truth is also that God knows and he is in sovereign control over the future. And somehow... I feel we need to learn to live with the mystery. And I believe that someday when we arrive in eternity, it will all be revealed to us. Last point I want to make is this. Why all this? What is the future that God is carrying us to all about? What is this future that God is calling us to? And to make this point, we'll read the last, the last verse, which is verse 12. Verse 12 to 13. He says, listen to me, you stubborn of heart, you who are far from righteousness. I bring near my righteousness. It is not far off. And my salvation will not delay. I will put salvation in Zion for Israel, my glory. I will put salvation in Zion for Israel, my glory. So when Isaiah spoke this, of course, Israel was basically walking in rebellion. They had forgotten about their God. And that's why he calls them stubborn of heart. That's why he calls them people who are far from righteousness. But God says he does all these things that he does. He declares the future and he accomplishes the future. Why? What is it all about? He says, for the sake of the salvation of his people. Ultimately, his own glory. Can I just say that again? Dear Saint, God declares and he controls the future in such a way that it's ultimately to bring about the salvation of his people. But even more importantly, that he himself would get all the glory. Two weeks ago, Sheshi spoke a lot about Joseph. An amazing, amazing story. Here's the thing. When Joseph had a dream about the future, causing his brothers to hate him even more, guess what? God was in the midst of it all. Working out, working it all out to accomplish some great good. 
when Joseph's brothers tried to kill him and threw him in a hole, they did what was evil. What they did was totally, absolutely wrong. But even in that, God was busy carrying Joseph to some great good that he would accomplish. When his brothers sold him, ultimately him ending up in the house of Potiphar, God was still at work in the life of Joseph, carrying him, working through him to accomplish some great good. When he was thrown in jail for a crime that he did not commit, God was right there, still with Joseph, carrying him through it all for his own purposes. When Pharaoh had a dream that nobody could interpret except Joseph himself, accomplish the salvation of his people, even allowing them to be captured, allowing them to go into exile, allowing them to struggle so that when they, cry, when they struggle, they begin to cry out to him. And he raises an unlikely source, a pagan king, Cyrus, to come and rescue them. God is ultimately concerned with bringing about your salvation and the salvation of his people. Amen? Second observation or second thing that I felt God was speaking to me through all of this. You are not in control of tomorrow. So submit yourself to him. You know, Jesus tells the story of a very rich man who had plenty of grains. And seeing how much grains he has, he says, I will tear down my storages and I will build bigger storages so that my heart can be merry and I can be happy and I can enjoy my wealth. And God looks at him and says, you fool, this very day, this very night, your life will be taken from you. But many of us believers, we live like this man. We live for self. We are motivated by our own self-ambition. Now, don't get me wrong. Prepping for the future is very good. Actually, the Bible says a wise man prepares for the future. But what I'm trying to get to is how often we live our lives as though we are in ultimate control. As though our agenda is the most important agenda in all of history. We are not in control. And our agenda is not the most important agenda. None of us here is promised tomorrow. In Psalm 90, David or whoever wrote Psalm 90 says, Teach me to number my days that I may gain a heart of wisdom. Wisdom is to be able to know that tomorrow is not promised. Amen? Can I encourage you, in all that you do, submit yourself to the Lord. Surrender all your plans, your wonderful plans to him, and let him be the one to direct your life. Thirdly, there is such a thing as eternity. There is such a thing as an eternity to be gained. So maximize the time that you have here in this world. You know, C.S. Lewis once said, if you read history, you will find that the Christians who did most good in this world, this present world, were the ones who were most focused on eternity. And when Christians have ceased to think about eternity, they have become so ineffective. One of my life statements that I have adopted, and it has helped me so much as I try to navigate and filter through some of life's decisions, was a phrase that by a guy called C.T. Studd, and he says something along the lines, we only have one life to live, and it's a very short life and it will soon be taken away from you, whether you like it or not. Only what's done for the sake of Christ will matter when we get to eternity. Dear friends, whatever you do, please, please do not waste your life on useless things. Do not waste your life on useless things that have no eternal value. Live 
with eternity in view. Whatever you do, every single decision you make, think in terms of eternity. Amen? And the last point I want to make is this. Don't let anxiety to get the best of you. Do not let anxiety and fear rule over your life. Because the Bible says, He works all things for your good. Not just some things, not just the good things, not just the bad things. Literally every single thing that you go through as a believer, no matter how painful it is, God will not waste it. Ultimately, he will work it out for your own good. And so I don't, just want to close with this and say, dear friend, if you are struggling with any battles, if you are filled with anxiety, if you are dominated by fear, may I just commend you this morning to him. Let your struggle, let your fear, let your anxiety be the very thing that causes you to cling onto him. Let it be the very thing that causes you to press on into him. The fact that God is in control of the future, I believe it's meant to be freeing. It's meant to be freeing. I believe we as Christians as ought to be the most peaceful people in the world. We ought to be the most free people in the world. Because God, who knows the future and controls the future, is the same God who is our Father. And the Bible says He is good. He loves us. He cares for us. We ought to be filled with so much peace. Uh, now, I wanted to finish with a song, uh, but I realized I do not know how to sing. So, so I'll, I'll just sort of hum the words. But for me, this is a song that often when I battle with anxiety or the fear about tomorrow, and uh, I think about uncertain days, it just comes to my heart. And I find myself singing it, even when I don't know I'm singing it. Uh, and it's a song by a guy called Bill, Bill Gator, something like that. And I'll just try and sing the chorus. And you guys can just sing with me in closing. Uh, the chorus goes something like this. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives. Amen.